All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me and Jason for the introduction. Again, my name is Jordan Rash. That's my uh, son, Owen, who's a lot bigger than that now. That's an old yeah. picture. I can't, I don't think I'd want to carry him around. Back, actually. <laughs> He's six. He just turned six last month. But um, I lead our organization's conservation transactions or real estate projects in this region. I've been with Portera now for uh, just a few months shy of six years. Uh, and today I wanted to give you a brief overview of what it is we do, uh, as well as demonstrate how the traditional land trust work, the land conservation work that we do, is informing the work that we do in, in urban areas. All right. So I grew up fishing, hunting, hiking, camping with my family. I also worked on family farms, as Jason said. And in fact, my first job was picking blueberries when I was 12. I'm guessing many of you in the room have silver cream and dots. Um, you know, I think I, my first year when I was 12, they were giving us 18 cents a pound for the berries. And you know, when you're a 12 year old, those 18 cents a pound really builds character. <laughs> <laughs> or at least that's what they told me. Okay. I didn't make a lot of money that first year. Um, I think, you know, you're picking 50 to 60 pounds a day. It's not a lot of money. I think I, I, think I came home with like $230 that summer. And, um, uh, I had to cost my parents more just to gas money to get me out to this uh, farm. It was a family friend that owned the farm, so I worked for them for a couple summers. And worked for another family friend after that from when I was 14 all the way until I was 20. Uh, and there was an iris farm. You ever been to Shriners Iris Gardens in Salem? Okay, drive through Salem, or towards Salem, you have to do one. Okay, drive to Salem uh, in late May, usually Memorial Day is our peak. Our peak, like I still work there. Um, and you'll see on both sides of I-5 are these huge fields full of tall bearded iris. So those are the fields I spent my summers in, got uh, scars on my fingers from nearly cutting my fingers off and uh, getting sunburned and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it was all, that was, I really enjoyed working for them. So anyway, uh, so those experiences shaped who I am. It's how I got interested in conservation and, and what it is I want for my kids, right? Uh, I want my kids to be able to go fishing. I want them to be able to uh, experience what farms are like and be out in the wilderness and see places that, uh, you know, that I've got to experience growing up. I mean, have you got to experience growing up as well? And so this is me when I was three and, uh, oh, poor man, you quit work, right? That's all right. You get the idea. This is 1986. Okay. In 2017. <laughs> uh, so this is me when I was three and my wife showed this picture to our son maybe he was about four, and asked who he thought it was, and of course he says, well, that's Owen. I'm like, that's me. Uh, unfortunately for him, it, or fortunately, it's not him. Unfortunately, he does look a lot like me. This, that's him from this year, uh, where he caught his first fish, uh, which was a really cool experience. And I want my kids to continue to have those experiences, and I want their kids and their kids' kids to have those experiences. However, if we do not work to protect uh, these keystone lands, you know, our, our farms, our, our lakes, our river, riverine areas uh, that are critical to our community, economy, and environment in one fashion or another, <coughs> then our region will not be sustainable. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. Uh, poor Maggie's a lot, so. Okay, we're going to probably see this throughout. That's okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, the, how many of you have heard of Forterra before, out of curiosity? Of hands, a couple, uh, or the preceding name of our organization, the Cascade Land Conservancy. Yeah, okay. You knew we changed your name, right? No, we do now. <laughs> yeah, all right. So, oh, you want to hear a funny story? Um, and I'll try to make it brief, get my rest of my presentation brief. But well, I, I came to Fort Terra in 2012. It was seven months before where we changed the name from Cascade Land Conservancy to Fort Terra. So the predecessor of my job was Ryan Mello, who's on our city council. And he was running for city council that year, so I went out sign waving for him like the day after they announced the name change. And I was just like, what are you doing? For for Terra? You guys sell pharmaceuticals? Are you a used car sales then ship group? What is this? And he's like, well, the reason for the name change, we don't just do land conservation, and we don't just work in the Cascades. So Cascade Land Conservancy was a misnomer. But of course, I pushed back and said, yeah, it's a great brand in Forterra. I mean, anyway, but that's the story behind Forterra, right? For the land, so it's not just about Cascade.
Alaska land conservation. It is about a lot of different things, which you're actually going to see now in my presentation why that is. So the, the crux of our mission of Portera is to ensure our region's lands, our forests, our farms, our floodplains, our communities, and everything in between are working in harmony to provide a benefit to our community, economy, and environment. And where there are lands that simply cannot be replaced or replicated, uh, we uh, uh, step in to make sure that those are protected for future generations and to enjoy. And we call those uh, those ones that can't be replicated or replaced keystone lands, uh, as they are keystones to a sustainable future for us all. So what do we consider a keystone place? Let me give you a few examples. Uh, one could be uh, an iconic wildland in the Cascade Crest, right? Something that uh, is threatened by uh, a, turning into a gravel mine, but happens to provide critical habitat or maybe some recreation uh, benefits. Maybe it's a prime farm that could be converted into a subdivision. An urban forest that's threatened to becoming a strip mall that's providing recreational opportunities to folks here in town or maybe it's providing water quality benefits to a salmon bearing creek. And maybe it's land near a new transit line that, would be, that could be ideally suited for affordable housing but might not if left to the private marketplace. And Forterra has deep experience in real estate transactions. I think we've done something like over 400 real estate transactions in 28 years, uh, valued at, I think, it goes, uh, got backwards, 650 real estate transactions valued at over $400 million over the last 28 years. So you can say that we know what it is we're doing when it comes to real estate, but we also think we know what we're doing when it comes to relationship building, which is equally as important. And those skills uh, help us successfully secure all these places and do a lot more than that. And what do we mean by secure? Well, you can't really read it, but it's kind of secure there, right? What do we mean by secure? Well, it means a few things. Uh, first, again, we started as land trust, right? So when we were founded in 1989, we were a land trust, like many of the land trusts. So the water work that I do is just buying stuff. We're buying land, okay? Whether that's Owning it outright, like turning it into a park or buying easements, I meaning we don't own it outright, but we own some rights to it. So it's protected as a farm or a working forest or something of that nature. Uh, it's a couple of examples of that. Uh, one of which is the Sidhu Farm, uh, which is formerly known as the Matlock Farm. It's a deal that we closed here about two and a half, almost three years ago. Uh, it's one of the most storied berry growing uh, uh, farms here in the region where many of us had our first jobs. Uh, I don't know if anyone worked at the Matlock Farm in the room? Yeah, several. Yeah, okay. So, it, it, lo and behold, so did our mayor, Mayor uh, Strickland, actually had her first job picking berries on the Matlock farm. So that that property was protected. The Tianway Community Forest in Kittitas County is 50,000 acres of just serene beauty, uh, water stewardship, uh, recreational opportunities, and wildlife habitat in Central Washington, and the Morse Wildlife Preserve here uh, in Pierce County near Graham. Something that we protected uh, with our friends at the Tacoma, uh, Tacoma Audubon Society uh, about 20 years ago, and we still partner with the Audubon Society to provide educational opportunities on that property. And here's a keystone land where we're working to conserve it here in the next couple of weeks. It's gonna close here, hopefully before December 29th, or else I lose our funding and it won't close. But uh, it's going to close, believe me, it's gonna close. <laughs> Uh, so this is a 143 acre property uh, just south of Sumner, again called the White Farm. It is keystone for its agricultural value, for its flood storage, and for its uh, wildlife habitat. And protecting the farm preserves the White family's legacy, the one founded by Jack White. Uh, and this here is, is Ellen White uh, holding a photo of Jack. Jack passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, and so they really want to see his legacy as a farmer be carried forward by protecting this property as a working farm for future generations. And that's important for the farmer. They lease their property out to a farmer. His name's Jake Storino, going to the Storino Farms. He, he farms on this property. And a lot of farmers just need to have that surety that their farm is gonna be there for them to continue to farm for many years to come. And if they're sitting there doing you know, these year-to-year -year leases, not knowing whether it's gonna be sold out from underneath them and converted into a subdivision, it's really hard for them to invest in that property. But in addition to these you know, rural areas, you're gonna start seeing us acquiring keystone places in our cities, uh, like part of a block in, in Seattle's uh, central district, which has been rapidly gentrifying <coughs> here in recent years. Uh, we increasingly see these kinds of urban projects as critical, and we have to create diverse, welcoming, and thriving cities 
since cities are no less part of a healthy, natural, and social ecosystem uh, than a farm or a wild place. It's where we live, right? Like an ant, an ant hill is the ecosystem for an ant. Cities are ecosystems for people, right? So they're important. We have to take care of our cities just as much as we have to take care of our rural lands to have a sustainable region. And if our cities start to fall, uh, fail people, then we get inequality and we get sprawl. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a couple slides. And so why does it matter what happens to the White Farm or to the Tianaway Valley or to the Morse Preserve? Why should we, why should you care about these lands? Well, protecting critical habitat, uh, excuse me, protecting critical habitat and important working land supports our regional economy. Whether fishing, farming, forestry, outdoor recreation, or the businesses that rely on those activities, uh, it also supports a quality of life that attracts people to live and work here. Uh, this brings jobs, brings investments, brings tax revenue uh, in support of our communities. It also reduces our impact uh, on the environment from air and water quality to ensuring sensitive species such as salmon uh, will continue to thrive here. And when we couple protections for open space with providing for affordable housing in urban areas, we not only help communities support their residents from, uh, and their housing needs, we also reduce pressure to convert open spaces uh, that provide habitat, that provide flood storage, that provide local produce for economy. This also fosters smart growth practices that helps to connect people to, to jobs, to goods and services uh, through multiple transportation means, whether that's a single occupancy vehicle, walking, biking, uh, carpooling, transit, you name it. They can get there without having to solely rely on a vehicle to get to where they need to go. It also means that people can afford to live in our existing communities without having to find a affordable home that's an hour outside of town. I'm using air quotes for a reason. You're, you often lose that affordability as you drive further and further out. So if you're spending an additional two hours in your, in your day in your car, think about how much gas you're going to burn. Think about how much uh, impact you're going to have on your car, how much more maintenance you're going to have to do. All of a sudden, that cheaper home or that, that lower rent that is you know, in Eatonville or something like that doesn't all of a sudden seem all that cheap. And you have to factor in those costs. And while these are all good things that we're doing here, the reality is that our work is threatened by the pace of development, as well as the policies that are in place that do not sufficiently incentivize growth in our urban core. Which creates, did I click? Try it again. There you go. What's going on? Is Technology. Technology indeed. Whoa. <laughs> Something happened. Something happened. Something unplugged. Is that there was an article published in the uh, business examiner not too long ago, uh, just a couple weeks ago, right before Thanksgiving, uh, where they were quoting an economist from Zillow. And many of you know that real estate prices or home prices have gone way up, right, in the last couple of years, and they're still going up. My wife's a, a realtor, in fact, here in town, and uh, she'll tell you the same thing. Well, it's gotten to such a point where we're not providing enough new housing and new, enough supply that not only the price is going to go up, but they're to such a point where someone's going to just break down and say, i got to buy out there. i gotta, I got to start looking for a new space to build right and build that new house because there's nothing available in the market right now so zillow says you're going to start seeing more sprawl again right mm -hmm. and we've seen what that looks like in pierce county and i've got a really great graphic it's actually it's animated and everything <laughs> but uh, if you if you've seen what it looks like in pierce county right we've seen what's happened to our some of our farmlands some of our best farmlands been turned into warehouses into auto dealerships into uh, highways into subdivisions and you know you can imagine what places like the Storino farm would look like if it were to be converted <laughs> into something like that right where you can no longer go to the peak of pumpkin patch and pick up your pumpkin and Halloween with your kids or your grandkids so that's that's one scenario that we're really concerned about is that if we're not able to protect those lands now we may be too late in just a few years I have another really great graphic, also animated. <laughs> um, but basically, what this graphic shows, well, you're, you're going to get it up, this is good. I'm going to start with this one. What this graphic shows is basically an aerial image of the region as it stands right now 
And as it comes up, um, what you'll see is this like white and beige areas overlaid to green, dark green, light green areas. The white and beige areas are development. So the brighter, the more intense the development, uh, the, the brighter the uh, color is, the whiteness is uh, in that area. So places like Tacoma or uh, the Meridian Corridor and Puyallup are very intense because they're dense, right? Um, the green areas are forests, the light green areas are farms and other open space. Yeah, we're gonna get there. Sorry, I'm a duck hunter, so I see ducks fly by. I'm like, oh, wait, no, you're too far. No, no, you're not. You're not. You're good. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, this is just, you already, we were talking about that. Let's get that. Okay, I want to do this animation real quick because it's really interesting. So, this is Jake's farm, Serena's farm. Um, and so, this is Leshai School. Coma Commencement Bay, right? So this is what could happen under existing zoning, especially once they certify the levy. It's a lot of houses, right? I mean, you're, a lot of this over here, it sort of looks like that, yeah. right? So it's not like we're having to make this stuff up. I mean, we're creating an, an artistic rendering. We are making it up. But uh, this is that map I was telling you about. So so you see this is the Kapalsen tree farm down here, the dark green, it, it's all forested. Um, it's working for us, so it's an intermix with clear cuts and such, but it's good that it's working for us and supplying uh, local uh, forest products from local mills, <coughs> jobs, things of that nature. Uh, but here's what, under existing zoning, that you would have in about 90 years. Wow, that's progress, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of houses. Um, I won't have any places left to duck hunt, um, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Uh, our mills won't be operating because there won't be forests to supply them because they've been converted to subdivisions. The thing is, you see a lot of green down here still, right? But you know what those are? Those are 80 acre lots. Now maybe someone's able to, to manage it for as a small family forest, but it's managed very differently than a commercial working forest that you have now. Just You just simply can't produce as much timber off of a property like that. And a lot of those are going to be more like you know, 20s and 40s, maybe even 80s, but most of them will be smaller than 80s. So it'd be hard to manage it as a working forest. Not only that, all the surface water impacts you're going to have, uh, your storm water impacts on the river. You probably won't have salmon left in, uh, you'll probably still have the South Prairie, because South Prairie Creek is relatively green still, because that's protected now. But probably won't have them in Ball Creek, Van Ogles Creek, uh, Clarks Creek, any of those small streams that are real flashy, because the water quality is so bad. So what you need, is you need someone to help prevent this from happening and making it look more like this, which is an alternative vision for what it could be. And it looks a lot closer to where we are now, but there's been some growth in the rural areas, just less of it, and where the majority of the growth in the region has been has been in our cities, where people are right now. And what you need is someone to help make that happen. And it just so happens that I know someone, oh, it's it's me. That's what I do, right? That's that's what I do. I'm trying to go out and buy conservation easements and buy places that <coughs> threaten from development. And Forterra as a whole, not just me, but Forterra as a whole, is also trying to help put uh, policies into place that would help uh, cities like Tacoma and Puyallup, the university place, to bring in more development, bring you know, more density, connect people to transit, uh, connect people to jobs. Right? That's what our, our communities need to be about too. So it's not just about the rural lands, it's important that we focus on our urban environments as well. Yeah. And Forterra has developed a comprehensive approach to addressing many of these issues, uh, many of these land use challenges. And what many folks don't realize, and I'm guessing many of you didn't realize in this room, is the breadth of the work that we do. You know, not only are geographically we're working from Mount Rainier National Park down to Commencement Bay, but we're not just doing land conservation. We're not just doing the work that I do. We're also doing policy development, doing stewardship. We're engaging people in volunteer activities to restore open space areas in our communities. And we put together what's called the Three Rivers Corridor Initiative, and it, it's basically trying to help people understand what it is we do by bringing them back up. Say, okay, let's let's step back from looking just at land conservation, and let's have you look at what we do as a whole and how all these things are connected. That what timer that, that is. No, oh. <laughs> I was concerned there for a minute. I think I'm getting close to the end. Uh, so we're trying to demonstrate how 
providing affordable housing in Tacoma is reducing <clears throat> reducing sprawl and reducing uh, the impetus for conversion in places like Sumner or Alderton or Eatonville or Roy, right? If you're able to provide housing here, you're a lot less likely to have to go out there to find it, right? So that's how it's connected. So that's why you're starting to see us invest in places like Tacoma, where we're buying urban real estate, not for parks, but we're buying it for some sort of community use, whether that's affordable housing, be a job incubator, you know, small business incubator, you can even be a uh, house or space for um, a community support of small business. You know, so you know, the mom and pop store, right, that just simply can't compete with a new project that comes in with new space, they just can't afford the lease rate. Maybe we can find a way to, to buy some property and keep you know, keep that, that business there at a lower rate so they can afford to continue to operate and community to support them for 40 or 50 years, right? Same, same concepts. And it varies, but same concepts to conservation work. Because how do you keep those folks there? Well, usually it's by some sort of deed restriction, like a conservation easement. That's very similar to what we do. So we don't, we don't put conservation easements on buildings, but the concept's the same, right? You're just trying to encumber a property so that it can't become you know, some market rate condominium project, but you might be able to have a new building say, we're gonna keep it as this. And that will allow like a, a small business or for affordable housing to take place in that property. I'm being way high level. I'm probably confusing you, but I'm also trying to get to this quickly since we're, I think we're almost out of time. So apologies if I confused you. I can answer questions here at the end, which is where we're at. So um, I just want to say, oh, I'm sorry. I have three, three things I want to tell you. So this stuff doesn't just happen on its own. And for this to be successful, there are several things that we would need from the community at large. Uh, one, we need support for our efforts to secure lands in urban areas for for housing, for community spaces, and other uses that are not provided by the private marketplace. Uh, support from the general public will help us to establish working partnerships with uh, public, private, and nonprofit entities uh, and deploy urban properties for these uses. And secondly, we need the Pierce County Council, uh, as well as city councils from Tacoma and Puyallup, to hear support for, for transfer development right programs uh, from their constituents. And implementing a regional TDR program in Pierce County would help us to protect more farmland while at the same time incentivizing growth in our urban areas. And finally, I've instructed the staff to help me with this one, and perhaps this is the most obvious, we need your financial support. So the staff are now gonna lock the doors until about $5,000, oh, it is $5,000 minimum, is donated before Kara. Can you, can you, okay, kidding. I like to use that joke because it's, it's, you know, it's partially true that we want you to lock the doors and give us money, but, um, the reality is that, you know, like any nonprofit, we just simply can't operate without the generous support of so many people in the community. I know I don't have to remind you all that. So many of the Rotarians are very generous with their money as it is. So I just want to say thank you for your support of Portero, for your support of other nonprofits, especially this time of year, whether it's Habitat for Humanity, YWCA, Downtown on the Go, Downtown on the Go. Um, you know, we, we just really appreciate that. So there, I'm going to finish. Um, 